Well, in terms of the response, you know, I knew initially um, as the day was unfolding um, that, that things, in terms of our ability to get quickly on the scene, have the right resources, and get quickly into the building and, and you know, confront and ultimately take on the shooter, I was, I was very um, satisfied with the response that day. Going back over the past several days and listening to audio recordings, looking at video, and, and really doing a much deeper dive, I'm even more satisfied that the officers really um, rose to the occasion. It's a horrible uh, tragedy for the families, and of course I, I wish we could have prevented this from happening to begin with, and of course that, I think that's what everybody has on their mind now. You know, there's 12 families now that have lost um, a loved one, so um, obviously well, everybody wishes there's more we could do, but I think in terms of um, the heroism that was displayed by the officers, um, we now know that uh, not only was one of our officers shot uh, in the building, but another one of our officers actually took two rounds to the chest, um, was uh, stopped by his, his vest. So he actually was shot in the chest in the confrontation with the gunman. Um, so we are extremely lucky that we didn't lose a police officer in there as well, um, and I think we um, through the training and exercising and all the, the things we've done over the past several years to prepare for something as tragic as this, um, we were able to save some lives, wish we could have saved more. You prepare, you do drills, you study incidents of this type that have happened in the past, and you bring all that, hopefully, to a situation like this when it occurs. In, as a practical matter, though, each situation is different. Similarities, they yes. Are. Training, of course, mm -hmm. that can help. And but, that's why but we're as you arrive, it's, it's, it, each one is unique, its own facts, its own challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's why uh, the, the chiefs around the country have uh, made a real concerted effort to do a really detailed forensic kind of analysis of each scenario and then get together with other chiefs and, and kind of walk through what are the things that happen in each scenario and each different uh, incident, what are the things that um, went well with our training and, and uh, practices and resources and what, what would have made things better for us because there's, a, there's always some little nuance that's different and um, I'm sure we will have, uh, I know we have some things that we will add to that uh, to that playbook now going forward. So um, How could you not? I mean. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean it's a lot of information and this is a, this is a huge crime scene so you know you're talking about a, a, almost a million square feet of office space. Um, thousands and thousands of items of evidence that are being recovered, analysis being done obviously in partnership with the FBI who does a fantastic job. Um, so once all that stuff is analyzed, I think we'll have a lot of things to take away from this incident, um, sadly, um, to help prepare for the next. Is there a final report in a formal sense after something like this? Do you get a, a, a binder at the end of the process? Well, um, you know, right now we're, I started the, the very next day, I started going around to the different units and um, reviewing, you know, everything that we have. As we get it, we review different things that we have. My goal is to upgrade or update training or policies or anything like that as quickly as possible. Um, so that will go on and is ongoing as we go through. But. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the day, there'll be an overall um, analysis of everything, uh, the entire government response to this, and um, that'll be used as uh, support for additional agencies as a playbook, uh, as I said before, sadly, because we know this is not probably the, the last one. Before we go any further, I want to ask about Officer Williams, and I want to give out the phone number, so I'll give out the number in a second. Those of you who have a question or comment for Police Chief Kathy Lanier can, of course, join the conversation here. We welcome and encourage and uh, appreciate benefit taking uh, your calls. It's really whatever uh, topic or question you have, uh, we're willing to entertain it here. We have an hour with the chief and we, we use it to our best advantage. So I'll give out the number in a moment. But chief, tell us how Officer Williams is doing. He's doing well. I spoke to him yesterday. Um, you know, he's, he's got a pretty serious injury, so he's still uh, in a lot of pain and uh, still got family and friends with him. Um, you know, we're hoping that he gets discharged in the next couple of days. So, He's close, um, but you know he's still got a pretty significant injury, so he's got some uh, recovery time ahead of him. 703-387-1020, that's the number here on News Talk. You can join the conversation with D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier if you are watching us live in the 10 a.m. hour. If you're watching it another time, um, stay with us for, for what will be, uh, I can promise, an excellent conversation. Uh, but for those of you who wish to participate with a comment or question, go to the phones now. We'll get to as many calls as we can, as always. So, again, 703-387-1020 is the number here on 
news talk. You mentioned audio tapes, you mentioned videotapes. I'm sure there's there's all manner of, of uh, data for you to f an analyze and, and, and synthesize. You said that having listened to some of the audio and seen some of the video, you were even more uh, proud and, 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 and sort of uh, not if satisfied feels like the uh, wrong word, but, but you felt good about the, the tactical aspect of the response. Can you go into it without sure. g uh, giving um, away any trade secrets, of course, can you talk more about why you feel that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what was um, immediately clear to everybody and all the officers I've spoken with, all the law enforcement personnel that I've spoken with from every agency, and that includes NCIS, United States Park Police, Metropolitan Police, Metro Transit, um, every agency, every law enforcement, FBI uh, SWAT team as well, everybody has said the same thing, that the teams mesh together, flaw I mean, just without hesitation, they mesh together. Multi-agency teams entered the building. Um, other teams merged once they got in the building. Um, and it was, it was just, um, I think, uh, impressive that the relationships and the training and everything just kind of rolled out so well. Um, the, all of the folks that went in there had the active shooter training. We trained together. We practiced together. We even practiced in a building with a similar layout mm -hmm. um, back in 2011. Uh, you know, a lot of large government office buildings have the same kind of challenges. This building in particular had, um, besides being extremely large, had um, high wall cubicles, you know, mm -hmm. thousands of high wall cubicles. Uh, is that a nightmare scenario? It is an absolute worst case scenario for uh, for law enforcement to confront the gunman uh, in that environment. And um, listening to the officers who um, did confront the gunman, who did go in, um, watching video, the, the way they just uh, charged into the building, went directly toward the gunfire, assisted getting civilian uh, and other employees out of the building to try and get, keep them safe, to cover each other and look out for each other, and then to, to do combat, uh, essentially, with this suspect in that building. Um, reach him and, and attack that scenario as quickly as they did. Given the size and complexity of the building, was just amazing. To have something happen on a military base in an urban and civilian environment, was there an initial looking at one another, not in a literal sense, of course, but in a bureaucratic way, for lack of a better term, who was in charge? Whose operation is this? Who is the leader, the boss? Who no. is running the show? No. How, why not? You know, I, I know that's what everybody thinks, and, and the first thought in people's mind is, is in Washington, D.C. especially, you've got so many people, so many law enforcement agencies, but um, this is not a discussion we have here. Um, we work together every day. We received a request from DOD, from the uh, Naval District of Washington, from the, the police there for assistance. Um, we respond to that request for assistance. We go in there as one team. We take care of what we have to take care of, and then we sort out the details later. And that's just the way it's got to be. There's no. Um, but the issue of who's the who's the coach, who's in command, who's who's very guiding. clearly. Well, you know, once once we arrived on scene, first of all, there, there was a homicide initially. I mean, as soon as the first homicide occurs, the Metropolitan Police Department's the lead agency. So. You know, everybody, everybody, I think, understands that in Washington, D.C., you know, the uh, statutory authority for investigating homicides is delegated to the Metropolitan Police Department alone. So that's the way we went in there with our partners, not knowing whether this was going to be an act of terrorism or not. Um, we asked for the FBI to partner with us and work in a unified way with us uh, throughout the entire uh, event from operations through still today. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, they have done that well, without any, any questions. So in terms of running the tactical operations, MPD um, had uh, incident command and was directing those operations. Do you know how the shooter got taken out? Do you know the specifics? I do. I do. Is that something that, I mean, I'm not, uh, Well, there, there's going to be um, information coming out. I think there is, um, as in the, in the coming days, there's going to be some information that, you know, Obviously, we, we would like to share with, with the public uh, for a lot of reasons, but that will kind of lay out a timeline and some things that, that we do know. Um, some of the questions that you know, we want answered will take a little longer to, to get answered because of forensic analysis and, again, you know, a million square feet of space and thousands of item evidence. But, but I think in the coming days, in a pretty short time, um, there'll be some images that will be released and some timelines and some things like that, and that will help people to understand um, just how um, heroic the officers were in their response here and just how complicated and uh, horrific this whole scenario was. Being trained to go in the direction of danger, whether it's a, a firefighter at a 
at a, at a blaze or a police officer going toward a shooter, I can't imagine the amount of training it must take to turn our instincts 180. Well, the one good thing, and I'll say this, uh, in my experience, I've experienced it myself, and I heard it over and over again from officers in this scenario, is um, when you train um, particular scenarios and then you enter that scenario in real time, um, it, you almost go on autopilot. It's muscle memory of the brain. Uh, you know, you, you, you train and you train and you train and you train, and then when things happen, you almost kind of go and automatically go into that mode. And that's why the repetition of the training is so important. Chief Lanier, stand by for just a moment. We'll take a break here. When we come back, more of our conversation with D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier, and we will begin taking your phone calls, Martin and Alice. Your calls will kick things off as we continue with our special guest, Chief Lanier. Don't go away.